it's nice to see all of you. I'm excited about getting to um, chat this morning. So, and we have enough moms on here, so we will go ahead and get started. I would love, to, as always, to see as many faces as possible. So when you're in a place where you can turn your camera on, please do that. It just makes, um, it really creates a different feel for all of us. We just feel so much more connected. So if you're able to do that or when you're able to do that, please consider that. Okay, thanks, Kathy. <clears throat> okay, so we are getting together today with, we had an assignment. So that's a different, that's a different thing for us. This is new, but as we're preparing for this coming year, we decided that we wanted to use the Catch the Vision course and start working through that together so that we could um, be a little bit, feel a little bit more prepared. So we started with actually a recording from the Belmont Listening Library, which is in Well-Educated Heart in the app and online. And it's the it's in March, the month of March in the under the Western Expansion section, if I remember correctly, under the Great Lives. So it is a story about Orson Sweat, Orison Sweat Marden. And I'm just curious to see if anybody was able to get through the whole thing, because I was not. I I've been on vacation and I was not. No, Linnell's shaking her head. No, Lindsay. No. Okay. Did some of you get a chance to listen to some of it? I, I did. I started, but then I was not sure how far we were supposed to go. If it was, I've never actually been in that part of the app before. So I was like, do I just listen to the one little section? Is there more? Is there, I just wasn't totally sure. Yeah, no worries. But you did get a little hint of it. And Lindsay Bunting, you were going to. I know I've listened to it before, but I didn't have a chance to like re-listen to it for today. Yeah, no worries. I knew that you had listened to it before. I knew that that was something. But I needed to refresh. <clears throat> and Monica Rogers, I know she's familiar with some of it. Um, I think she's seen, had access to some of his stuff before. Um, yes. Okay, wonderful. So ladies, um, is there anything that you would want to share right off the bat about what you read, even if you listen, read or listened to just one chapter of his life? Is there anything that you'd like to share as we start? Don't be shy. I made it through, I think three or four chapters. The beginning was really hard for me to get through. And what I found is that it's difficult for me to be mom tasking and trying to listen to an audiobook because I couldn't grasp the story. I had to re-listen to it four times. And by that time I was like, I've heard this too many times and <laughs> I wanted to move on. So it's hard for me to start a book as it is, but then to have interruptions with the children and things to do. The assignment felt really big for me, but I wanted to do it. So I kept pushing through. So. That's a plus for having an assignment because it helps encourage me, but the the size of it felt overwhelming to juggle mothering and I wasn't able to get into it really. But by the time like chapter three or four came around, then there was some storytelling. So the neat thing that I got out of this is that I was just telling my boys that I was listening to an audiobook and they said, tell me about it. What are you reading? So I was able to practice a little bit of storytelling and I could tell them about the bear and the, the, the mountain lion, or it was like a, what did they call it? A cat, wild cat, oh. I think is what he called it. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was able to just explain that to them and they loved the adventure. So that was a neat experience where when I do something, they're interested and I can share with them and then they're interested. Yeah. And they know that you're doing this. They know that you're pursuing something on their, li because they're young, they're not, they're not, thinking, oh, my mother is enriching her heart, you know, but they know that you're listening to stories and that you're learning. There's that awareness in them on some level. I love that. And it does take a bit to get into it. And I will confess, I had no clue how many chapters there were. I would have given us about five chapters to listen to because I thought there's no way, there's no way. But then I thought, well, maybe I'm going to be limiting them. So I'll just wait and see what happens with this week. And then we'll go from there. So that's very good to know. Okay, somebody was going to share. Was it Rachel Holloway? 
No, I was getting, I only had my phone and I was getting on my computer so I okay. could see everybody. <laughs> so okay. I think you probably heard my echo. No worries. No worries. I love the story. It's a beautiful story. I'm probably about halfway in. And I, I love that we can read stories from people's lives, people that have done hard things, um, really difficult things. It helps to give us a little bit of perspective in our lives. Um, helps us kind of uh, realize, all right, so life is hard. Uh, not as hard as maybe somebody else's and, um, or it is as hard, you know, and it's really tough, but I can get through it because somebody else got through it, you know, and it helps to teach us those lessons. And I love that there are some kind of exciting, if not just terribly sad parts in that story that you can include your children in or share with your children, um, especially if you have older children, great lessons that are there. Ida, Lindsay, Monica, those of you who are familiar with, a little bit familiar, might remember a little bit from your previous listenings to this story. What would you share about Orison, Sweat, Martin? Well, I started, I mean, I think I've listened to the podcast before about him, which encouraged me to buy the, his book, Pushing to the Front, um, which I haven't read yet. But <laughs> I tried to it. start it. I do. I do have it. I tried to start it a couple times and just wasn't able to really get into it yet. Anyway, um, but I did listen to the chapter on the solace of nature. I haven't listened to the whole thing. I had started it weeks ago, last month, I think. Um, and it's just a slow going. But I listened to the solace of nature chapter today, and I really enjoyed that. Um, I've always kind of felt that for myself in my own life. But one thing that he mentioned in there was... Um, how much spirituality that he gained from nature and how much he learned about God from nature mm -hmm. and how it didn't really correlate to what they were talking about in church and how he wished that they could that that they would instead of teaching in the church that they would teach outside and I can't tell you how many times I've wished that in my life <laughs> I, always in between like meetings at church I would have to go outside and just like get some fresh air and I'm like man why can't we just have class outside like this is so lovely out here <laughs> so. I think that I think that humans I think if we saw ourselves <laughs> like fish and we need air you know to breathe but like <laughs> outside nature air to breathe I think that we would be a lot healthier and happier people I love that you go outside in between I think that's awesome um go ahead Ida um, thank you Monica I, I don't have his book but I wanted to get it so that's really cool that you have it um I listened to it after I heard Marlene talk about it and I think it was in the introductory course or no 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 she does one of the podcasts about him that's right what it was so I listened to that and I was she said in there your kids might enjoy listening to it too but they probably won't get into it until about chapter three so I was like okay so I started listening to it and like Linnell was mentioning um my kids were kind of like eh but then when he started telling the story about you know walking through the woods when he was a little kid by himself in the dark and he had all these things happen they were like riveted on yeah. what was happening right anyways um it was just really, uh, I, I just loved, I loved reading about his life and the things that he um, overcame because he had a lot of really hard experiences and he was really alone, you know, and he was blessed with like, I feel like Heavenly Father blessed him with um, the right people in his life when he needed them that would help him to like make it through or or like nature or a dog or different things that helped him to have something to hold on to, you know, and, and that he just was so persistent and persevered, like through it all. He never gave up on trying to do like what he thought he should do. And I love, love, love the part where he talks about the book that he found. And I can't remember what the name of the book was. Um, it was self-help. Yeah, it was like a self, like one of the original self-help books and he found it and read it and it changed his life. You know, like he had focus and direction and purpose after that. And um, I guess that really resonated with me because I love self-help books, <laughs> maybe too much. 
<laughs> but anyways, and I don't know. I just, I, I really love too that he always remembered his mother, like even though he didn't know her for very long. He remembered that she was kind and loving. Mm -hmm. And like she, he had this like angelic memory of his mother. And I'm sure she wasn't perfect, but she was a good mother and trying to do her best. And that was just so sweet that he was able to hold on to that. And also that his father was a good, loving man too and tried to do, you know, everything he could for his kids. Even like, you know, as he struggled trying to take care of them after his wife died and then he ended up dying too. And so I just, I think how powerful it was that he had known what it was like to be loved by his parents. So I just really, it was a good, good story. And it does take a little bit to get into it, but it's totally worth it. Thank you. I love that. I loved this. I loved all those parts that you mentioned. I love the things that he, um, was able to cling onto and that those memories small and short as they were were so powerful and helped him to be able to get through these incredibly difficult things um, and how sweet that that memory of his mother was something that sustained him but he did come from this loving home that father who was father and mother for a while and trying so hard yes emily is saying it was so sweet that his father worked so hard to keep the house, make the clothes and all the things. Yeah, that was just incredible. I thought that was so, so very, yeah, so very touching. I think he loved, hold on. Um, it's so sweet that his father worked so hard to keep the house, make the clothes and all the things his wife had done. I think he loved his children so deeply. It was touching, yeah. And can, I, can you imagine being in this time when the grandmother who was given the three children realized as much as these were her grandchildren these this was family but she got to the point where she didn't have enough money she was so poor and she did not have the ability to care for all three so she let this six-year-old little boy go be let out you know to a, other families i i can't imagine that i you know i think no you would just do whatever you had to do you just i don't i don't know but I don't know. That was a whole different time period. And then the families, the different families that he was in and the fact that people could treat another human being like that. I, I don't, I can't imagine that. But then for him to, as a little child, have those experiences and still be resilient, still have hope. Um, yeah, that's pretty incredible. Pretty incredible. Um, it shows what you can do as a person inside, if you hang on to something, what is it that, what is it that causes a person to be able to persevere through incredible hardship like that? Linnell. You're talking right now, just reminded me of a part that I read how he was a champion of children and he helped give perspective on what children need and they need to be able to play and make messes and they learn from that. And if you continue to tell them to stop and don't and correct them, then that kind of squeezes childhood out of them. So I appreciated that perspective and how he used his own challenges to help and bless others. Okay. So would that be a definite blessing that came from his incredible sacrifice, his incredible that trial? He understood what children really needed to flourish and then was able to be, I love that phrase too, a champion of children. I love that. Thanks for sharing that, Linnell. I'm also learning from this experience. Oh, look for a podcast first and make the assignment and just listen to the podcast as an introduction because I'd forgotten. I listened to that podcast and that's what made me really want to know Oris and Sweat Martin. Yeah, Ida too. Yeah. <clears throat> that made you want that. And so you were willing to dig in and you also had that information that, oh, hold on, it's going to take till chapter three <laughs> before you're, before you're really in this. So that's helpful as well. Okay. What else? And does this remind you of other, oh, Paige, please. 
Yeah, I, I was just going to share, it's pretty much the same, like similar thoughts, but kind of where Linnell was talking about um, just not squeezing, like, the, and he talked about the joy, just squeezing the joy out of your children, you know, and just, like, being happy, and, like, it just made me really think, like, how, how do I do that, you know, like, am I letting them be happy and laughing and just being a child and made me want to like look at myself and think too like maybe maybe I need to laugh more and be more childish and just you know I just look at my kids and sometimes they're so so goofy and do silly things and like it reminded me of something I read one time was like you know like while you're at a restaurant blow bubbles in the cup with your kid you know like just you know, because they love to do that. And it was just like these things that as an adult that we look at that we shouldn't do that in a restaurant. We shouldn't like, you know, blow the bubbles in the cup, you know. And I'm just like, but maybe we should do more kid things just to bring more joy into our lives as well. And then I just love the part too about when he, his first Christmas that was away from his family and how heartbreaking that was just you know he got that one candy stick and and he couldn't even eat it because he remembered because he was just comparing it to how much um love that his father had and that just broke my heart just so sad for for that little boy and how how important love is yeah oh I love that page thank you for sharing and it's really fun to have you with us too by the way um yeah doesn't it doesn't it make you want to be a champion of children you know and we can be right don't you if you think about it we have opportunities in our lives in smaller ways perhaps but just when you see a child in the hallway at church or something and they're sad or they're I don't know anything you have a, an opportunity to connect with that child and make them feel a little bit of love, a little bit of connection, a little bit of happiness. Um, there are opportunities for us to do that. And then with our own children, I loved what you were saying, Paige, the questions. And so I wrote down, you know, am I letting them be happy and be a child? And so many times from the perspective of a mom with older kids, I love to watch moms with younger kids. And like I've said before, not in a judgmental way, not judging the mom, but looking at the situation and realizing, oh, wow, as moms, we really get caught up in thinking that we have to be making our children be little adults all the time. And that's not to say that we don't treat them how to behave when they're out in public and how to sit quietly on the bench in sacrament meeting. And, you know, these are responsibilities that we do have um, to, to whatever extent you see that, you know. But in all the other times, in every other situation, you could let them be children and and you wouldn't be failing as a mother. I don't know why we have got into our heads. I'm sure somehow Satan was involved (laughs) in steering this a little bit off course. But how did we get to the point where we think that being a mother means restraining and restricting our children's happiness? Because sometimes that's what we're doing. And I think sometimes it might not be a bad thing to say, why not blow bubbles in our drinks? Why not let them stomp in the mud? Not, I don't, I don't mean your situation, Ida. <laughs> Why not let them get out there and get dirty? Why not make that part of our lives? And if you're thinking about, no, I'm going to let them, in, I'm going to encourage this. Well, then you would probably set things up a little differently. Now, this is just a silly example, but I'm thinking if you realized my children love to be outside and get all muddy and dirty. Then I'm going to send them out and I'm going to give them a, a pair of play shorts, you know, or something. And that's their clothing to wear outside this shirt, this shorts, whatever. And you guys can get these as dirty as you want. When you're done, throw them in this bucket and come inside or something. I don't know, you know, but like, or when you're done, let me know, lock the door so they can't sneak in when you're not watching. 
but then go outside with the hose and hose them down, but don't hose them down in a, like, I can't believe you got so dirty. Oh, you know, let me get all this off of you. But in a, wow, you guys are amazing. Look how much fun you had. Look how dirty you are. You have mud on every part of you. you have mud in your ears, you know, whatever. Okay. We're going to have a shower and then make it something fun, you know, and hold it up over their heads, get a special spray nozzle. I mean, you know, do something to make it a fun thing. Um, throw some bubbles in or something. I don't know. I don't know. Get sponges and some soap and put it in a big bucket or a tub and let them after the mud sponge themselves all off or whatever, and then hose them all off. I mean, but something, but make it to where it doesn't make your job harder. It actually makes your job easier. And they're having a blast. They're out there just being kids and enjoying what it means to be a child. Now that doesn't always require them getting filthy dirty, but that's just an easy example. And then also, I remember, I, there's a book that I absolutely love for um, training children. It is my favorite. And it was written in the mid 1800s by a man. I've mentioned it before, but his name is Charles Turnbull. Trumbull. What is it, Lindsay? Is that right? Trumbull? I, I can never remember the name right. But anyway, it's called Hints on Child Training. And you can usually find it on Amazon. And I, I highly recommend it just for what you learn about children. Um, he talks about will, W-I-L-L, will training versus will breaking. Gives an example of horses, you know, and how you break the horse and how other methods are. No, you don't break the horse. You train the horse. You work gently with the animal and train it. Um, and everyone can have their own thoughts about that. But I love the idea that with a child, you are training their will to be obedient to you. And then as preparation to being obedient to God, that's how I always see that. Ida, did you? I was say? just gonna say, let me respond. <laughs> <laughs> when I was telling that story yesterday, I thought, why don't I let them play in the mud? And I was thinking about all those things and like, that's so much fun for kids. And I'm like, how can I make that better? Like, so that it's like, I don't care if they get muddy because mm -hmm. honestly, do the clothes really matter? Not so much. Most of them are like hand-me-downs or from like the thrift store. So I, I was thinking about that and I was thinking about it like when we we're talking at the beginning too. And I was like, you know, I should just let them play in the mud, go get, get dirty. And then I'll hose you off <laughs> maybe on a hot day. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah like I think we get so caught up in being like having like you said little adults like even at church I think sometimes mm -hmm. I look at kids being crazy and I <laughs> and to some extent I feel like okay maybe take them out of sacrament <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh, uh, you know like just some silly things that kids do and it's like it's okay they're just being kids and we want them to like love and enjoy being at church you know right and that's the goal because i mean and to be able to fill the spirit and that's not going to happen if everybody's telling them you know don't be kids while you're doing this you can right. only be adults right so anyways just yeah so maybe i'll send them out to get money today yeah. <laughs> i already I already have to raise clothes so it's fine <laughs> Yeah. Well, I was watching moms, you know, at, during the winter on that thousand hours outside. And there were moms that were taking the big Rubbermaid bins and putting them down in the snow and then filling them with warm water or warm soapy water. And their kids were getting in those tubs, you know, in their bathing suits right in the middle of the snow, you know. And I was thinking, that's so cool. That's so cool. One of my kids' favorite um, home videos has the three older ones. Um, they had gotten all muddy. They'd had their bathing suits on. They'd been out in the, in the yard and playing around. And then they found mud. And then they thought it was super funny that they were smearing the mud all over their bodies, you know? And so then I made them come over so I could take a picture of them, you know, and I have them all in these goofy poses, you know, because they've got mud all over. And then since they were getting attention, then they were putting it on their faces and everything. And then my youngest at the time, because all the, the other kids, they were getting all this great attention. Mom and dad were laughing and coming out and recording them and everything. So she goes and get, grabs some more mud and ha, on her tongue, <laughs> you know, sticks her tongue out. And then, of course, everybody howled. And so forever since then, that's been one of our favorite 
on video. It's just Kate with, ah, you know, mud on her tongue. So it's just so goofy what they think is funny and what they enjoy and remember as one of the most fun things that they did. And it took nothing from me. We have a family story of my three boys outside in our yard when we lived in Washington and we had a dog and they decided to have a poop fight and we're throwing dog oh. poop at each other. <laughs> I was like, for real? <laughs> Anyway, so I did, I, I remained calm even. And I was like, all right, well, I get to hose you guys off and like take off all your clothes. We're just going to throw them in the garbage. So yeah. maybe that's the oh. <laughs> If you direct it properly <laughs> towards the mud, that might be better. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's so funny. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So anyway, so I, back, I get so distracted. So back to that book, on, Hints on Child Training. Um, he talks about the importance of children behaving. He talks about how there are places where they need to act, you know, a certain way. And you can have children being children, being reverent and polite and quiet. They can be taught that every single one of them can be taught that, but um, it'll require different things for different children, right? And different children have different limitations. And as the parent, you can learn what that is. Oh, look at Paige drinking her celery juice. Good girl. <laughs> Well, there are different, different things that you do, that you do with each child, you know, to teach them that, but yes, um, there's a degree of respecting the child in them, of also understanding their expectations or what your expectations could be of them, and then taking the time to train them. But in this book, as he teaches all of those things, he'll say, if you see a child misbehaving, that's the parent's fault not the child's. So don't treat the child unkindly. Don't be frustrated with the child. It's not the child's fault necessarily. Now that's a very wide, very broad um, response, but fundamentally that is true. Um, and not to put any blame on the parent, but to remove it from the child. Okay, so not as a judgment on the parent, but a removing that blame from the child so that the surrounding adults can be more kind and loving and understanding of the child. That was super helpful for me. And then the part I love the most about this book is at the very end, after all of his very practical advice on child training, but with such respect for the child, such love and, and understanding of the child. At the end, there's a chapter on I think it's called Making Christmas Magical. And he talks about the importance of the adults taking the time and making the effort to make childhood things that should be magical, magical and special. And I love that. I love that in this time in mid 1800s, you know, this was where people's lives are so busy just getting the daily stuff done, right? Because everything is made from scratch and everything is you know, you're gathering wood to bring in to make fires. And, you know, you're not just turning the heat up because it's a little cold and you're not just throwing whatever in the oven for breakfast. He talks about this thing that they used to do in those days where every child got a different color of string assigned to them. And the parents, after the child children went to bed, the parents would take this piece of string and start from their present under, under the tree. And it sounded like it was like one present, you know, and they would tie the string to the present and then, each adult would take a, one of the things of string and then they would go around the whole house, winding the string around behind the grandfather clock and under the dining room table, you know, between the legs of the table and back behind the chair in the parlor and back out in the hallway. And you know, anyway, and then when the children came down in the morning, there were their, their end of the string, you know, and then they would have to take their string and then follow it and wind all around the house until they got to the the main room where the beautiful Christmas tree was and the presents under the tree and to find their present, you know, anyway, I just thought that's a lot of effort for the adults to go to, to make this magical for the child. And just that little story. And I may have not retold all the parts correctly, but just that little story gave me this idea that, Oh, I need to put forth a little bit of effort, <laughs> you know, like, Sometimes I feel like I would respond to my children as if they were kind of a nuisance and they were keeping me from getting the housework done or my studying done or dinner 
like planned and prepared or something like that. And then I would like kind of come back to reality and think, um, and think, uh, sorry, I got distracted by the chats. I'm so sorry. Um, I'd come back to reality and realize, wait a second, what are you here for? What are you doing? What is the purpose of your life right now? You know, it is raising these children. It is teaching and training them, not making sure they put away their clothes, not being caught up in whether their room is clean or not, or whether they brush their teeth or not. Not that you don't need to do those things, but what's your purpose here? What is your purpose today? Is your purpose making sure that they get their, their, you know, this job done? Or is it making sure that they feel loved, supported, that they learn to be responsible, that they learn to, you know, whatever it is that you're teaching them. It's that they learn those things, not that they get the checklist done. Why doesn't that checklist concept that, that we keep trying to throw out for ourselves, why aren't we trying to throw that out for our kids? Does that sort of make any sense at all to anybody? Because I think we throw that checklist thing in there. Okay, but it, no, 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 they have to, I have to get on them because they have to do this, this, and this, or not do this, this, and this, rather than I have to make sure they feel loved and not in a coddling, not in an excusing all the behavior, nothing like that, because I had high expectations. My kids had to work hard and they had to get their stuff done and they had to be reverent at church and they, you know, like all this stuff. But, but I learned that I could do it in a more loving, supportive kind way rather than the drill sergeant that I naturally want to be or naturally am. Emily, did you have some thoughts on anything? <laughs> I, I took a few notes um, from the book. There were some excellent um, things. And as you're talking about making um, things special for your kids mm -hmm. and the memories you have, um, I've had the opportunity to go to several funerals lately and I know the people really well, but um, it's interesting in the life sketches, the things that the people remember about them and that are so special to them are really quite ordinary everyday things. It's not always the trip to Disneyland or the cruise or the mm -hmm. big gift or something. It's like his garden and he always brought me flowers, the first blooms or the, you know, whatever it was, it's really ordinary things. And in this um, biography about Orison, um, he, his motto really stood out to me. I've only made it just over halfway through, but he wrote in his first tablet, let every occasion be a great occasion for you cannot tell what fate may be taking your measure for a larger place. And, um, and I just thought, just those everyday things, if we make them special, like they are, then they will be remembered and they will make a difference. Um, and I, I was just speaking with um, my sister-in-law and she was telling me about her missionary son and some things happening. And it just reminded me, we don't know why he, he's just had a change and he's sad about it because you grow to love the people you serve and um but we don't know what's ahead and why this change is happening and and the growth that he will get from it but I think of that for um for my kids too as I'm teaching them um these things and softening their heart and softening mine just the ordinary things can make such a difference I had a my my 12 year old, we went to see an architect firm this week and had a little field trip and it was really fun. And, and he sh was able to share with me some things. He's like, well, mom, I've done this. And remember those pallets you let me just screw together and make anyway. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So some things are like coming together in his little 12 year old mind. He's like, I understood what he said about this because anyway, and so those ordinary things really can be big not to overstate it because I don't want like not all the pressure, but, but just taking it kind of as it comes and making it important and special. Um, I love that. And it also doesn't have to be every day. One of those, one of those fun, simple things can, can, uh, what, I can't think of the word, but it, but you can get a lot of mileage out of one one fun thing that you do and enjoy with your children. 
And um, I think that's pretty, pretty amazing and, and shows a lot of mercy on Heavenly Father's part that <laughs> it can take just a tiny bit of us being a little more relaxed or a little more creative and it makes a big difference for our kids. I love that. Other thoughts? I'm just typing up that quote that um, Emily just shared with us. Okay, and does anybody else have like techie kids? One of my sons, every time he has to use my phone, he doesn't like that I have my screen, um, not my screensaver, but that I let, let, have my phone set to stay on, you know, to not shut off for quite a while because I like take notes from it and stuff and he always changes it back to like five seconds or something like oh don't do that <laughs> I do that for a reason yes I know it shortens my battery life but I don't really care so anyway okay other thoughts about this I just love this idea of am I letting them be children but obviously Remember, I'm saying there is a balance. Don't you, you know when there's when somebody puts something on social media and they state uh, they share a principle, and then everybody comes on like with all the opposite, like but 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 it's like yeah I know I know, <laughs> but I'm just trying to put another thought in your head that you might be able to kind of think about how could I incorporate this in my life a little bit more. Anyway, I always feel bad for the person who puts that initial post on and gets slammed. Okay, Emily. Um, so I didn't know who he was and I haven't finished the book. So I, I Googled it and, and found out anyway more about him, but um, they, they listed some quotes and I don't know where, if they're from his book or if they're, I, I don't know anyway, but one that I really liked that kind of went along with those ex um, making every occasion great is he's, is it says, don't wait for extraordinary opportunities. Seize common occasions and make them great. Weak men wait for opportunities and strong men make them. And I, um, anyway, I just really like that one too. That's beautiful. That's powerful. I love that. That would be one I would want to frame and put in my house to remember, not just for your children, but for you too. Can you read that again, please, Emily? Don't wait for extraordinary opportunities. Seize common occasions and make them great. Weak men wait for opportunities. Strong men make them. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's really he, powerful. As I, as I read the first part of his life and how, I mean, how can people be so mean, first of all, mm -hmm. to a small child who has no one? How can you, what happens to like the women that, I, yeah. I just, it was hard for me to listen to that. And um, anyway, there, there was, how does he keep hopeful? How does he not then turn into a mean person? I mean, he cared for and loved that little um, pet dog that he had and, and how he did everything for that dog and was so upset when he lost the puppy and all the things. And I just thought, how does he stay so kind? And then one, okay, I mean, there's another quote. <laughs> anyway, right. he, he has said, there is no medicine like hope, no incentive so great and no tonic powerful as expectations of something tomorrow. I thought, how did he keep that through that time of that something will be better tomorrow? Um, I, I was amazed and, and it, it kind of alludes that he didn't always, there were bad days for him too, that he just struggled, but but he pushed through and um anyway I, I still i can't believe that some of the women that he was around could be so mean i, I right. just anyway to a child mm -hmm. to a child how do you do that how does your mother heart not just come into play and and cause you to rescue the child i don't understand that yeah i don't but i don't know different time period different i don't know i don't know rachel Oh, I just wanted to speak to the kind of making things special and making occasions. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking, um, sorry, gosh, this is like a horrible thing. Cause every time I get on here, I'm like, oh, 
<laughs> Sorry. Okay. Here I am regrouping. <laughs> I was just thinking about um, when, before my mom passed away, she came <coughs> to visit and she was like, do you remember <coughs> when we used to have terrific kid parties? And it was something I, I had <coughs> put in the back of my mind. But as we talked about it again, I was like, oh yeah. And we, she just would have these terrific kid parties. And so she said, let's do one for the kids. And just like a day to just celebrate them being them and just, you know, balloons <coughs> and, um, <coughs> you know, a note for each of them. And it was just like, let's celebrate you being so awesome. And it was one of my most memorable <laughs> afternoons with my kids. You know, we went out and did bubbles and we had a special dinner and everybody had balloons <coughs> on their chairs at the table. And um, I just think, I, <coughs> I feel like that's one thing that I got from my mom was just the desire to make those little things happen <coughs> or to take advantage of the, um, the mundane celebrations, like <laughs> we, we celebrate all the days when it's national bacon day. We like have all the things with bacon we have done, you know, for April fool's day, we have a tradition and we do the crazy cafe where it's <coughs> our meal. They just order a, a character, you know, there's a character and they order it. And that is all linked up to something different. So they may get for their appetizer, you know, a fork and a napkin and spaghetti or like whatever it is, it's all mixed up. And so <coughs> there've been a couple of times I was like, oh, my kids are getting too old. They're not going to want to do this. And every year that is what they want. They're like, well, what are we going to do for the crazy cafe? You know, when are, we're having it right. <coughs> and I just think there is so much value in establishing those traditions I've seen that, that is something that I really look back to and, and look back on that I have carried forward and the things that just are so precious to me, it, <clears throat> it isn't all of the big trips or things. It, it truly was those things that just made childhood feel magical in some sense, in that stability and having a, a tradition and in having, <coughs> Um, just celebrations, just being able to celebrate so many different things, little things and big things. And anyway, yeah. Oh, that's so sweet. I love that that's um, part of your life and what you do and that it came from your mom. I think that's wonderful. Very sweet. What a wonderful woman to establish that so that then her grandchildren and great grandchildren probably, and you know, will be able to experience those kinds of things. I love that. Thanks for sharing that, Rachel. Very sweet. I was thinking during this time as we were talking about Sally Clarkson, um, and why was I thinking about it? It was something about what we were talking about, but it's this, oh, I think it might've been that she talked about um, setting the table and putting candles on the table. You know, because children love when candles are on the table, it just makes them feel like, oh, this is something special. And what does it cost us as parents to throw a couple of candles on the table and light them, you know, um, little things that make it magical for our kids. I, I still buy um, stuff, make sure I have things in the house that on certain holidays I can, I mean, even just like do green milk and whatever on St. Patrick's Day. And I, I don't know anything about St. Patrick's Day really. I mean, I learned this year and made it a very significant holiday, but in the past I just did green everything, but I wanted to do something fun, you know, and Valentine's Day and stuff like that. And one year on Valentine's for Valentine's Day, the whole month, because my husband and I don't usually celebrate Valentine's Day. We're more of the, this should be every day. Like, you know, I don't need a day to celebrate that kind of a thing. So, um, we, so I did Valentine kind of activities for him every day, but the 14th, you know, on that month, you know, stuck balloons in his car or notes everywhere, just, you know, cookies to the office or whatever. But um, because it doesn't matter how old you are, you still like all those things. I don't think we really grow out of having special fun things happening in our lives. Paige. 
Yeah, I just wanted to share too how much I love traditions and that that's been a huge thing for like that we've started in our family um and over the past year we I started this binder and so each holiday um I've been like kind of writing down what we do and just so because like it's amazing how much you forget (laughs) What, what did we do last year for this holiday and so we've been trying to write um write down so like for Valentine's this year, we did a tea party and just, you know, we just had our fun little, little tea party. And then I was just flipping back through this binder and like, what did we, for New Year's, we went ice skating and we had a game night and we made homemade donuts. And, you know, so I just, I love traditions, but I love um, that I've been able to like make this binder and for each holiday, then I can add add in the stuff that we're doing each year and kind of keep track so I can and then it makes it easier to plan the next holiday too so like oh what did we do I can just look back and you know we can do it again yeah and And, you can do the exact same things and they'll still think it's amazing yeah and so it's been um, a really easy way to kind of keep track of things and remember what we are doing so that we can make it a tradition yeah I love that idea of recording that and doing those fun things. Um, Also, and you know, as we've heard from some of the examples of these things, they don't have to cost money. They can just be time that you spend together or a recipe that you try. And I was thinking about this. There are probably things that you think, I never have time for this. Well, make it a family activity then. Find a way to make that something you do as a family. And then you're not taking away from your family and you're adding to the experiences and the happiness of everybody there. But I love your book. I love that idea of writing those down page. That's wonderful. Cause we do forget, even if the things seem amazing and wonderful, we forget Melissa. So I'm really, really bad at letting kids be kids. My mom told me I came out of the womb an old lady and she's right. (laughs) Um, But but I have to write stuff down too. Cause I, it, the fun stuff doesn't stick out to me a lot. I have to write it down and and be very intentional about what we're doing or else I forget and let it pass by. But um, I have I have a little kiddo that has a holiday birthday. And I was like, how are we going to make this day special? Because it's not, you know, just the holiday. And so on his birthday, we invite everyone in town that like our friends that don't have family to celebrate with. And we have a huge party in the backyard and we get pizza for everyone. And he likes watermelon, that's his favorite food. So we have a watermelon cake instead of a birthday cake. We have fruit all over, like just a huge fruit melon cake and just throw a huge bash for him in the afternoon. That's awesome. The morning to celebrate the holiday and in the evening, but the afternoon is his. And we just play and invite anyone that wants to come because we can't regularly get different people because of the holiday. And he thinks his birthday is the coolest day ever. <laughs> I love that, Melissa. Um, and so I'm glad we were able to do that. But something else that we do for Christmas Eve, we don't do like a conventional Christmas dinner. We pick a theme every year. So like one year I was pregnant. And so we picked the theme baby and we had baby back ribs and eggs and lamb and baby carrots and baby corn. And I have little kids. They, those are great um just all the things baby and then last year for for 2020 we picked our 20 favorite foods so everyone got to pick however many that divides into our family favorite foods and we had everything from like donuts to shrimp (laughs) we just had like a full-on buffet of 20 different foods for christmas eve dinner so i never know going in what what we're going to do for christmas eve until we sit down that's so cute but they all, every year is totally different. And our tradition is not being the same, I guess. Yeah, right. Very creative. I like that. I like that. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, sometimes you just have to, because sometimes it's not our nature. You know, we're not, like I always say, I'm not fun. You know, so I have to think outside the box. Like, okay, what could I do to make this more fun? Um, And sometimes you realize, oh, actually I'm more fun than I thought I was, you know, because you just, I don't know, you learn a little bit more about yourself, but I think you're right. Your phrase that you said earlier of being intentional. 
I think that's important. We get caught up in trying to make sure we're getting everything done and we forget to be intentional about the, the teaching and training our children and allowing them to be kids and enjoy their childhood. Yeah, I have to schedule the fun for them in for me. <laughs> yeah, and that's okay. That's okay because it still happens. But at least they get to have it then. Exactly, Melissa. Exactly. I love that. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? We're kind of we're talking about or Orison. Still talking about him, his life, the things we learned from him. Talking about how application, how we take what we learned what we felt from that reading or from our talking about it today and how we can apply that to us and to our kids. I also, going back to what Paige said earlier, I liked her comment, the question also, am I being childlike sometimes or you know, more often than not? How am I doing at that? Hey, is it okay if I share? Yeah, hi, Abby. Hey, so I was just thinking about how let kids be kids. I am totally the worst at that. Um, I grew up kind of, I didn't really grow up in the city, but I was born in Vegas and then we like moved to Utah County. And so I kind of say I'm like a city girl. And then I met my husband who's totally like farm boy, country boy, play in the dirt and get dirty. And like, I'm a total girly girl, like a bug lands on me and I freak out, you know, but it's funny because I have three boys now, so I kind of have to um, get over that phobia. Uh -huh. But now that I've had those three boys, I've like my husband's had to tell me like multiple times, like, you got to just let them play in the dirt and get messy. <laughs> and like, I, I feel bad, but it's like sometimes now they're like, oh, I don't want to get dirty. I'm like, oh, no, what have I done to them? So I'm like trying to, you know, fix that and let them play in the dirt and get muddy and be OK with it. And, you know. But um, I also wanted to share about today, my son really, really, really wants a dog, but we can't have one where we live here right now. And, but he has like some stuffed animals and stuff. So he actually planned out a birthday party for his dog today. And it's funny that you were, you guys are talking about this because I actually got mad at him today for <laughs> something so silly, but he like wanted to turn on a movie because it was his dog's birthday. And I, I know, I, I don't know why I'm getting emotional about it, but just like from listening to you guys talk about it, it's made me realize that like, I need to settle down, not be so uptight about it. Um, and he just wanted to do this fun birthday party for his stuffed animal. I'm going to let him do it. And we're going to make cookies for his stuffed animal today. And, and he's already wrapped presents for him. And so, yeah, it's going to be a fun day. And I really liked what Rachel said and what Melissa shared. Those were really awesome points. And I love the family binder. That's way cool. Something I want to start doing. So yeah, thanks guys. You are so welcome. This is why we come together because we can share all these ideas with each other and motivate, encourage, inspire. So remember, this is no guilt. This is, well, no, I guess I, I think I'm learning some things. So I'm, I'm going to change that to being no shame. <laughs> Sometimes feeling a little bit of guilt is okay because it motivates us to make some changes, right? Repent and make some changes. But the shame does no good, does nothing positive. So we look at ourselves and we say, oh, I want to be better. I want to do better. I can. And we can be motivated by another mom. We can look at something she's doing and say, oh, I really like that. And rather than beating ourselves up about it, we just say, oh, I, I think I could learn from her. I think I could, I could change. And maybe it's going to require me being humble enough to say, hey, can I talk to you about something? I see that you're really good at this. I, I, I would love to learn how to do that a little bit better. And I think that within our little community here, we're learning that we can do that. Um, maybe not with all women, because some of them just don't have that soft heart to understand where we are. But we're learning that this is possible, that you can create a connection with another woman that can be so incredibly helpful, that can help you grow and develop and build, and you can help her grow and develop and build. And I think that Lindsay Bunting and Linnell could share something with us right now about that. I'll share. 
yeah, so I, when I asked that question, um, I don't know, a few days ago about um, parenting and lying and hitting and stuff, just, I was just struggling um, parenting. Then, yeah, Linnell reached out and she's like, I have some great tools <laughs> to help. And so she's just been sharing with me and we've been going through that Simply On Purpose course together. And it has, see, I can't talk about it. <laughs> It's been life changing for me. So it's warming my heart and changing lots of things. So I'm just so grateful that she took the time to, to reach out and to help me. So that's all. <laughs> well, and Lindsay, that takes you being um, humble and open and receptive to somebody stepping in and being your guide or your mentor as you're learning these new skills. And Linnell, I thought that was because Lindsay shared with me how much this means to her and the difference it's making. And Linnell, I think that is so wonderful that you are so open-hearted and so willing to help and to share like that. I love that. I love that I see that all over in this group. It's just, it's really beautiful. And Linnell, I would like to know from your side of it, how do you share something that you are good at or that you have some knowledge of or some experience in with that, with another mom? How do you get over the natural man's kind of feeling of, oh, whatever, all those negative things that can come? Like, I don't, I don't want them to think that I think I'm so great or I don't want to, I, I don't know. Like when we come on here, you talk we talked about how we show in our Marco Polo group, some of our successes, but then like me, I'm so bad at, and some of the other moms, we make excuses for ourselves and we apologize for, for the thing that we're sharing that we should actually be able to say, Hey, you know what? I have this skill. Let me share with you. Let me help you. How do you do that? How do you get over those negatives? I, I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. I just don't have the words like you to. I have a few yeah. thoughts. I think different people have different strengths. So mm -hmm. you ladies have strengths and are really good at things that I'm not good at. And so maybe this is just one of the things that comes more naturally to me where, and maybe I learned it from my mom too, that my mom didn't look to others for her own self-worth or importance. She was grounded in what she knew in herself. So I think one thing could just be nature and it's just my nature to be that way but also another thing that i think of is i think of the scripture uh, about um the candle on a hill is that how it goes that when you have a candle on a hill you don't want to hide it under a bushel you want to let it shine and so i feel like if there's something oh, i also think of just um the Lehi's dream and the vision of the tree of life when he tried the fruit it was so delicious he wanted to share it and so I think that could be part of it too that this course that Lindsay's talking about was life-changing for me and I have seen so much benefit and a change and a feeling a difference so in the same way that we want to share well-educated heart with others when someone is interested in learning about simply on purpose and parenting, I'm passionate about it. I get really excited. So I just want to share with others. I want to help others find the same joy that I found. And something that Ralphie teaches in her class is that when a student is ready, the teacher appears. Oh. And so I truly think that Lindsay was just in a place where she wanted to learn and she was ready to learn. And I just so happened to have had some tools and I offered them to her and she wanted them. So I think it, it just worked really well that Heavenly Father puts us in places and allows us to meet people who can bless us and help us if we are ready and willing to learn. And so I'll add another side here where Rachel reached out to me personally and she's been, um, we've been talking. And so Rachel has been a big help to me. So these connections of Marco Polo and she shared some things with me and she's helping me with some things. And so it's not just one way, you know, it can be all over and we can help each other in all sorts of things and make connections in different areas of our lives with different people who have different strengths and different experiences. I love it. Thank you, Linnell. And I think it's super interesting that we have 
me as a facilitator for our discussions because I do not do well at putting things into words. I know that I am not, that's not my strength, but, but that I am always reminded when I'm struggling to put words together. And then for example, Linnell comes and <laughs> says what I took five minutes to say, you know, in a paragraph um, or a sentence, I think that's okay. That's okay by small and simple things. <laughs> So we have to be able to look at our strengths and our weaknesses and know that it's kind of a package deal and somehow it's a good, it's a good thing. And, um, and then take the opportunity to share our strengths with someone else and receive somebody else's strengths to help us. And I, I love that. I see that in this group. I just, I think that's beautiful. Thank you, Lindsay and Linnell for sharing that. Okay. So just Kathy. to add, just really quickly, um, I, it must come from scripture or gospel principles or something, but I remember reading that our gifts and our talents are not like, they're for us, but they're not. And we have them to use for the benefit of others and to share our light and gos the gospel in that way. So just a thought about. Beautiful. It's Beautiful. for us, but not totally. Right. Our gifts and our talents are for the benefit of others. That's one of the main reasons we have them. I love that. Thank you for bringing that out, Cassie. Beautiful. I also loved the um, principle that you shared, Linnell, from Ralphie. That is, when a student is ready, a teacher appears. Now, you moms, that would be a really wonderful thing if you could grab onto that and hold that in your heart when we're, when you start to worry about your children and how are they going to learn a thing, you know, and what am I going to do? And, you know, when I get to this point or whatever, when a student is ready. So when your child is ready, a teacher will appear. That doesn't have to be a person. It could be a resource. It could be an interest. It could be a person, you know, but there's so many things we don't have to worry as much as we do about we just need to be open, have our hearts be open so that when the opportunities come or when the direction comes, we hear it. Melissa. Um, just to go off some of the thoughts that have come up in the last minute or two mm -hmm. about like when things are ready or small and simple things are your gift. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my friend on the screen. I have a friend here. This is my neighbor <laughs> and um, Hello. I guess I'm gonna tell a little story. We moved into this house and we don't have really any little kids in our neighborhood. We're not one of those neighborhoods that have like loads of little kids. We have a lot of single people and older people. And uh, I served my mission in the Philippines and about a year and a half after we moved into our house, she moved in and she's from the Philippines. And she um, had a little boy, that's my kid's age. Oh. And in the Philippines, you kind of live outside all year. You don't like living in your house. You live in your yard. And so she's always out in her yard. She has a beautiful garden. And I don't have a beautiful garden. Um, but she's always bringing food by and sharing and all sorts of stuff. She brought pizza when she came by today. She's like, here, I made pizza. It's Friday. Um, <laughs> and, um, and just this week, she said, how do you figure out if you're in a homeschool? I'm thinking about homeschooling. And I was like, well, you pray, <laughs> figure it out. And um, then this morning I felt like I should take my kids on a walk and it's really hot and I didn't want to because it was really hot, but I was like, okay, let's go. And we hopped out and she was in the backyard and her boy's like, can I come? And so they hopped on our walk and we started walking. She goes up a block is a yard sale. They've got loads of books. And I was like, well, we'll, we'll go one more block. And a homeschool family was having a yard sale and getting rid of all their curriculum. <laughs> and we live in a small town where that's not common. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, buy some books if you want to homeschool. <laughs> this is this is your chance. And and uh, then on our way back, I was like, well, I have a meeting in a half hour. If you want to join, we're going <laughs> to try to do this. And just all those small little things play yep. into it. The fact that I have a Filipino neighbor that I can practice my language with, that we have kids the same age, that I went on a walk and she came along and knew about a yard sale. Just all those little things to help. God, God knows it all. We just have to let him do the organizing. Right. Right. Exactly. And we have to respond when prompted like you did. You didn't want to go for a walk. You felt like you should. You did. And look at all the great things that came from that. 
Yeah. I love that. And I know Ida is excited about your Filipino neighbor because Ida served a mission in the Philippines. So that's oh, cool. I <laughs> Lots of connection. Yeah, Melissa, where did you serve? <laughs> Hello. I, sorry. Um, I served in Kauaian Mission, formerly Alagan Mission. Oh, nice. So you speak Ilocano? Um, I should, Tagalog? but I was just spent my entire mission trying to learn Tagalog, but I served in Ilocano and Ifugao areas. Nice. Nice. We I taught in seven different languages. We can <laughs> chat later. I won't like hijack the meeting. <laughs> No, but that's so exciting. I love that. Very cool. Very cool. Okay. Rachel said, absolutely agree. God is orchestrating such great things. He is. I was up until 12 last night talking with one of the neighbors here in this neighborhood because, she, and she had this incredible story and um, we made this, I knew of her. I learned of her a month ago and then I forgot. And I, and my son reminded me last night, said, have you, have you made a connection? Have you reached out to her? And I said, Oh no, I haven't. So I texted her and she said, well, what are you doing right now? And I said, well, I'll, you know, I'm free. So she met me in the street. We walked up to her house, sat on her back porch and talked for three hours. And um, we left, we hugged, we're best friends now, you know, <laughs> um, we just made all of these connections talking about homeschooling, talking about teaching our children, talking about foundational principles. Um, she's, I mentioned in the teach our own um, group, but you might not have had an opportunity yet to check that, but she started a brick and mortar school eight years ago, I think from a prompting her kids were in public school. And it was like, you know, you, years ago when she was first married, had this idea, just this thought come into her mind during a conversation with somebody, you're going to homeschool one day, you know, and then forgot about it years later kind of a little preparation for this and then the okay it's time and okay time for what you know and so she responded started this school it, she started a kimber academy if you're familiar with that and then um then after a couple of years of that knew that she needed to change that and so they changed it into their own private kind of a school and now what she feels strongly compelled to do lindsay bunting is start a family education kind of a like a not a camp a family education place like having a place that has inside and outside and has gardens and has um, animals and and where families are supposed to come together and learn and grow and um, and I said oh my friend Lindsay Bunting has this vision I mean just this idea doesn't know what it means, what it's supposed to become, but knows that, and I said, it sounds so similar. And um, she said, yeah. And then this other friend of mine, you know, so mothers are being gathered together and given these little tiny glimpses of you're going to do something, you know, you need to prepare. So I believe that we've been given our different talents, our different gifts, because of the work that we as mothers will be doing over the course of our lives. And when talking to this mom, one of the things she mentioned was, um, well, gosh, there were so many things and I wanna share them all with you. I told her, you need to just come and be a guest on one of our Fridays and share some of these things. But um, she talked about, she, what she feels is this family education I can't think what the word was she called it family education something that its purpose is to prepare train and prepare something like that this generation to I'm butchering it but to prepare the world to meet to meet our lord you know so um I do believe that we are part of this work so be open respond to the promptings that you receive just in your little world with your little family because though that's the preparation that you need as we figure out what the bigger picture is you know and what's coming but be open and talk to people meet people if you feel like there's this opportunity and you you kind of second guess it like oh no I'm too shy or I'm too something like that Linnell like family education co-op um but but if you hesitate, you know, think, no, I need to be brave. This is my, this is my work and I'm being called to this work. So, so meet those people, talk to those other moms, 
reach out and make those connections because we need to figure out what it is that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but I just was so excited by that conversation, by the connection that we made and a lot of other things that I learned. She brought up the Millennial Press and um, what's the author's name that George Q. Cannon, Lindsay, I know you know this, um, but his great granddaughter or something. His, like great granddaughter. Yeah, I can't think of oh. her name, but Allie she's carried Can on that idea of his at work. Yeah, Allie Cannon Eisenach or something like that. Yeah. The power of principle. Anyway, she talks that about right. um, she talks about her grandfather. He talked yeah. about saying that Zion would not be built until. Do you know this quote, Lindsay? Talking about Zion wouldn't be built until the children or something were properly educated in the not the world's education, but in the correct principles or something like that and I, it sounds I've been familiar searching. but I don't know the quote right I'm gonna so. get the book <laughs> well I'm gonna get the book I'm gonna get the other millennial instructors that I don't have I just have the the one on the B but I want those other two and if I find those available somewhere I'll let you all know but this is this preparing our children for Zion you know and um, teaching these principles for the future. Lindsay, were you going to share more about this? I would love that. No, I'm just so interested in how she's going to do this and what she's going to do. I feel like, um, yeah, that like idea has been put in my heart and I, but I just keep being told like, it's not going to be for a while. You're just preparing, you're preparing. It'll be a while down. So I'm interested, like she's going to do this and I'll be able to see it. And then when it's my turn to do that, I'll have this example so it's really right. cool right so cool to me yeah and she knows that some of it's in the dis in the future as well but she said i just have this feeling like we're going to have a really big garden and it's going to help provide food for people and we're going to have these animals and it's going to be because they will help maintain us you know like a community and she said i don't know how that's all going to be but it'll be yeah. people will sacrifice and contribute and i said like law of consecration kind of stuff she's like kind of, yeah i think kind of like just people choosing to keep their covenants and participate to the level that we can participate in the law of consecration right now as we yeah. are you know i've had that same thought with art i've thought somehow whatever i'm supposed to do later it's going to be filled with beautiful art but i don't have all that beautiful art i don't know where it's going to come from but interesting well and she said there. she said and it will be beautiful like the temple grounds like the the outside part it's not a, it's not just a utilitarian thing um well it's just super interesting yeah because wouldn't you think if you get to that point like I start thinking of like emergency preparedness or whatever. And it's like, no, we're somehow like Heavenly Father has this perfect vision of things. And we as humans take it and go, oh, oh, I know what you're talking about. Okay, here, this is what it is. And he's like, well, I guess that's okay for right now. We'll let that go for 20, 50 years, you know, and I'll give you a little bit more and see if you can't grasp the bigger picture. And then the next time we go, oh, okay. I see you mean this big, you know, and he's like, well, <laughs> and over time we get a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. And he's still going, it's this big, you know, how can you not see it? But um, he wants to give us everything. He wants us to feel joy, to really, really experience joy and to understand that and experience that in our lives. And we're the only ones that limit that. Um, I just, that reminds me there's, that quote from Orson to bring it back to Orson Sweat, yeah. um, Martin, it's on the joy. I'm going to butcher it. I better go look it up. But um, he has that quote that there are joy mines or joy landmines everywhere and that we just need to learn how to find them and extract that joy from them. Like, wow, that doesn't make any sense until I read his quote. But it's on the mother. I think it's the mother's university. Go find it. But I love that. They're like, like the the resources are all around us like heavenly fathers put all of the the places where we can find joy everywhere we just have to learn how to find them and extract that joy um 
and we don't we can't quite understand it yet let's say it says the whole world is full of unworked joy minds everywhere we go we find all sorts of happiness producing material if we only know how to extract it i love that i forget I love that those one. things I read him and I think they're so beautiful. And then I forget that I read them. Happy. That's like the only thing I remember from him, like the joy minds. The joy minds. <laughs> I love that. But if that's the thing you remember, that's powerful. Happiness producing joy minds. Is that what you said? I'm talking to myself. Happiness producing joy minds. I love that. That is really beautiful. Um, and uh, again, I think that he wants us to be happy. He wants us to be happy. <laughs> We're the only ones that limit that. Um, and we need to stop doing that. Um, oh, I is asking you to put that in the chat, Lindsay. Did you see that? Okay. Um, oh, I was going to say something about that. Um, I think it was, I was studying the lesson that come follow me this week. Oh, I think I showed you, I put notes. No, I can't remember. Um, but I was taking notes and it was the, it was what you, I'm sorry, I'm stuttering all over the place. Ida, did you share about Emily and David and their lesson this week? Okay, so that, I just took all the notes. And, um, oh yeah, I shared some of that. Ida, go I ahead. I was thinking of it when you were talking because it was like, Henley Father just, he wants us to have all these things. And I love their discussion about the three kingdoms and how like, there's just so this huge area of space for all the people, you know, like you, everyone gets some reward and like how, right. how hopeful and how like, I can't even think of the words to, to like that. You get to decide how much Jesus you want. Like you can have, yeah all of him or you can just have a little bit it's up to you you get to choose like you get to decide how much jesus you want in your life and and heavenly father wants to give you whatever you're willing to accept like you just get to say okay you know i want all of jesus in my life i want to be in the celestial kingdom i want and then and i love how they talk about it. it's a journey of like just a minute it's a like it's a relationship like we're trying to become like yes. celestial beings so we're, we're, it's not like a des just a destination, but it's a, a journey and a process of up and down, like constantly, you know, making mistakes and then trying to get better. You know, I love that. And like that we, he has so much joy for us. He just wants us to be happy. He's like the magic maker, right? He's like, I want to make the magic for you people, but you just have to like take the guide, you know, take Jesus as your guide. And I, <laughs> anyways, I'll stop now. <laughs> It was oh, awesome. no, I it, it was so good. And I'm really happy that you shared it. There was so much that I learned from that. Me too. And I hope I learned, you know, I'm hoping that. Did you want to share more? I want to. Me too. No, I just was, I listened to it again today. Cause I was like, I feel like I want to think about this more. Like, you know, you have, I mean, for me, I'll hear a talk or something. I'm like, okay, you know what? That was so good. And I feel like I missed a lot. And I just want to like listen to it like yeah. five or 10 more times. <laughs> right. So you can fill in those holes, those gaps, you know? Yeah. That was so powerful. I, I wrote down one of the things that they said was the savior intends to save me. That's his intention is to save me. I'm the one that limits that, you know? So, but his intention is to save me. <clears throat> I love that. And I loved that. How much Jesus do you want today? That's kind of casual, you know, to throw that out there, but I can hang on to that and I can think about that. And so I put that into a, how much Jesus do I want today? Like how much am I putting him into my life today? I say, I want him. I say, I believe in him. And I do, I say that I, that I, that he lives, that, um, that he performed the atonement for me. I, I, I know that how much do I access that? How much do I let the atonement change me and affect me? Not, not in my life, in the overall picture, and I can stand up and I can bear testimony of that and whatever, but what does that look like today in my life? Do I have him here today, Ida? I love too, they talked about the, they um, shared some quotes from, I think it was Joseph Fielding Smith about the differences of, you know, like who goes to what kingdom mm -hmm. kind of a thing. And it was so hopeful. And I think, 
you know, we think, um, I don't know, I guess maybe it's just me. I'm always like, I think about like the celestial kingdom is almost seems unattainable and it's not really so unattainable. I don't think, you know, like Heavenly Father intends to save us. He wants to save us. He wants to help us. And I loved what they talked about. Like he's talked about, um, the difference between the celestial and the celestial is like accepting the testimony of Jesus or rejecting it. And like, he talked about that and like, well, like, like Jesus is going to testify for me. Like he's going to be my advocate. Like, am, am I going to say, no, I just want to do it on my own. Thanks. I'm cool. I'm going to be my own representative in court. I got yeah. this. Or you know what, Jesus, if you could just do this for me, that'd be really cool because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and you clearly know I'm not, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> But I just, I mean, it's, it is, like you say, it's a little bit casual, but also it's like, I can like, I can fathom that, like I can accept the testimony of Jesus. So when I think about it, like in that way, it's like, I try to follow him and keep the commandments, but I'm not perfect at it, but I want him to be with me, you know, like I want to be with him, you know, <laughs> I can, I just, you know, yeah. So I, I love that too. It was really sweet. Yeah. Um, I, I love that so much. Anybody else have anything to share on that? So cute. She closed the door on you. <laughs> so oh, sweet. am I still here? I'm sorry. Yes, but it's so sweet. It's just darling. She's, she's tattling on her sister. Daddy closed the door on me. Oh. Oh. But it's okay. Be okay. You want to sit with mama? You say hi. You want to say hi? Say hi. They can see you. Run away. <laughs> so sweet. I just love little people. All right. Oh. No, you're great. Okay. So toward the end of that, they said something about, okay, the in verse 69, when talking about um, that top the highest of the kingdoms. These are they made perfect through Christ. And then I just changed by him because they chose him. So am I changed by him? Am I choosing him? No, it was just made for a lot of good questions, a lot of good pondering. But I think about this idea of how maybe we've always thought that it was so like this dark and um, uninviting and so difficult to be able to reach. And one of the other things they said, said was um, it talks in the scriptures about it, about the just me, just, it's just this person plus Christ. Um, and, but just me plus Christ equals the fullness. You know, if I, if I want that, I can think of that equation that because of grace, than just me, just me being me, imperfect, never being able to do it all, trying my best, hopefully, but never being able to do it all. But if I link myself to the Savior, then, you know, that can qualify me for that fullness. And that's incredible. That was just beautiful. But anyway, thinking about the, the different ways of thinking about religion throws us back again to Oris and Sweat Martin. And that chapter on nature that... Um, okay, hold on. Emily, was it you that read that this morning? No, who was it that read it this morning? Not that it really matters, but, um, but anyway, one of us read that chapter, that listened to that chapter this morning. And um, that is so beautiful. That idea that he had about, you know, can we just do church outside? Like in nature, that's where I feel like God is. He was so so confused because at church, when it was back in those days with the hellfire and damnation and this fear of God, and he was always disappointed in you and all of that versus how he felt when he was in nature and saw all of God's creations and felt this awe and this wonder and beauty and everything. Well, he had it right. Not that we have to have church outdoors to experience it, but just this different idea of who God is. And I liked that learning too. Linnell. I'll share two things that I really liked from that video that Ida shared. One was when she was talking about um, the rules that she had in her family, how the difference, the only difference between being in level two and being in level three 
was you had to do all of the level two things for two days. And I thought of how we are asked to become like Christ. And the only way we can become like him is by being consistent. We have to do it day in and day out and continue to do the same things. It's not like we have to add more to our lives or to-do list or, or anything. We just have to be consistent. So I appreciated just that example of simplifying it that mm-hmm. I, I be like Christ and be like Christ tomorrow and I be like Christ the next day and keep doing that. And then that will allow me to have a celestial happiness and pre- like just being now, which is what I'll earn later and after yeah. in the eternal in, eternities. And then the other thing I really appreciated is her experience with her friend who wasn't a member of our church and she was of the Christian faith, but I was, I'm always so impressed with the faith and perspective that other Christians have. And I feel like I could learn so much from others, but I don't have any friends and not that I don't have friends, sorry. I don't have any friends of other faiths to be able to learn from them. And so I've been watching the minimal mom and on Sundays, she and her twin sister do some pastor, I think her sister is a pastor. So they do some Bible chats and they talk about the spirituality and lessons. So it's very much familiar to me because I know the scriptures that they're talking about, but the perspective that they add is so different and it's refreshing. And so it makes me want to go get to know more people from other churches and be able to learn from them and chat with them and allow them to enrich my life too. I love that. And I love that you use the word refreshing because I've talked before on here about how there just seems to be so much more hope and this just celebrating Jesus and being so positive and optimistic and not this downtrodden, guilty, negative kind of a feeling Lindsay that just reminded me I can't remember where I read it last night I was on Facebook or something and it was this woman and she was just talking about how refreshing it was to be living in um the UAE United Arab Emirates oh, yeah. she was living there and she just thought did you read that I don't know where it was I yeah. can't remember and she was like it's amazing everywhere you go there's all these different religions but everybody has this unified like um, core belief in God and they all share the same God and they talk about it and you talk about it with strangers you meet at the store like you know I'll pray for you and um, it's just normal we're here you're afraid of offending somebody if you mention God and she just talked about how amazing that was like the most amazing thing about living there was that she would just talk to people of different faiths Muslim and Hindu and Buddhist and all these different faiths um, that all were respectful of God and that they all believed in God. I don't know. It was just really cool to hear her experience. It was beautiful. I loved that. And it, but it was also powerful because my conversations that I've had with our friend, Andrea Ray, that doesn't get to come on here usually because she's in Abu Dhabi. Um, Actually, I think she's in Utah right at the moment, but she's been living in Abu Dhabi. And she said, it's just the, the friends she has made and the conversations that they have all these different religions different people it's been so uplifting and they so connecting and i love that i love that okay sorry and we're missing um lindsay today that's so different to not have lindsay's bubbliness i know lindsay cardall or lindsay Watkins. well both of so so i was just thinking okay yep, li- i was thinking friends. of lindsay Watkins. she's always there and she's putting in all the messages and the chats and she's sharing stuff and then lindsay cardall is bubbling and you know her cute little self just she's so cute i know i know both. lindsay i don't know where lindsay cardall is but lindsay watkins they are probably on their way to the um scotland highland games oh that's They're, right she's super excited that's yeah, very she's fun that she's doing that, that for months yeah so that's yeah. Fine. Okay. I love that, but I miss them. We miss everybody, you know, when our moms aren't here, but it's summertime. So, um, I think it's really interesting when I was talking to this other mom last night, they, um, their mothers of influence group meets once a month, you know, <laughs> that's the, she said, you, you meet every week. I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
And I said, we have found that it, it feeds us and it's, um, it's been very, very positive in our lives. And then when you add to that, the fact that we um, engage on Marco Polo during the week, it's crazy, but we are building something amazing. And these friendships and these connections that we're making are so beautiful. I'm really grateful for each one of you and for those connections. It's making such a difference in my life. I want to share things with you guys. You know, things happen in my life. And, and besides my own family, this is where I come to share what I want to share. So it was interesting to me the other day when I realized, oh, that was my first go-to was after my family was you guys. So I, I love that. And I appreciate you for that. Does anyone want to talk about anything else on this topic before we leave this? Because then I'm going to shut the recording off for a minute. But I would love to have any other, if anyone wants to share anything else on what we've been talking about. I love that we were able to share about Orison, this incredible man. Don't you look forward to meeting him one day? I do. I'm really excited about that. And aren't you grateful to your friend Marlene for introducing you to her friend, Orison? I think it'll be so cool. Like, think about that. All these random ladies, like, what, 100 or so years later, are going to come be like, Orson, we love you. <laughs> like, how cool is that? <laughs> Anyways, I thought that was funny in my head. Yeah, no, I do too. I have that picture. <gasps> He's like, <laughs> Thanks, Marlene. <laughs> but how wonderful for him to have been able to have such an influence. And he continues to be a champion of children because his messages and his teachings live on. And I love that. Um, if we have no other thoughts, we'll go to Linnell for a summary of this discussion. And then any who want to stay can stay with me for a few more minutes. I feel like we've talked a lot about ordinary things, but really significant things. And I had an experience this past week. I am one of those moms who doesn't like messes and I'm trying to learn to embrace the messes and allow for my children to be children. And on Monday, it was a holiday here because it was um, observing Independence Day. Well, that's neat. So the kids were playing outside and I took them out at six o'clock and they were still out there by 11 o'clock. My husband had to do some cleaning. So they were outside for five hours and they were playing in the dirt. So they were filthy and I didn't want them coming in the house and touching anything. And so I did the next best thing and I shot them down with the hose, but they thought it was the coolest thing. It was 11 o'clock at night and we were outside and I didn't want to mess, which is why I did that, but they just loved it. And so the hose water isn't the warmest. And one of my sons was gasping for air, trying to tolerate the freezing temperatures of the water. And so I would try to shoot him, but he would run away. And so I decided to give him quick spurts of water and just try to help him get through it faster so that he wouldn't be gasping so much. As soon as I, done, I was done showering him and I was drying him off, he asked me, Mama, do you know what I felt in my heart? And I said, yes, you felt love. And he said, yeah, I felt like you loved me when you were spraying me with the water. And then the next thing he said was, when we have a family home evening, do you want to ask the question, when did you feel love from your parents? And I can share this experience. <laughs> and that just melted my heart. He felt love from me because I was giving him squirts of freezing water instead of a long stream blast of water. And this was such a beautiful experience to me. I feel like we are rewarded and we receive these blessings and these glimpses of joy when we extend ourselves just a little more than what we are used to and what we think we can handle. And I feel like these little moments in motherhood are really what keep us going and push us forward. And it's our children, their innocence and their their simplicity, but their joy that just spills over to us. And so as we've been talking, I, I thought of my Flex of Gold journal, which I've shared before with you, but I wanna read from it from the beginning again, because I think it really pertains to our discussion. 
It's called The Parable of the Minor by M. Russell Ballard, 2011. And it's this story is adapted from the, his talk, Finding Joy Through Loving Service. And he says, a young man journeyed west, hoping to strike it rich during the California gold rush. At first, he was full of energy and certainty that his fortune was just around the corner. But his enthusiasm faded when day after day, he dipped his pen into the river and pulled out dull rocks instead of dazzling golden nuggets. At the end of an especially long hot day, the young miner vented his frustrations to an elderly prospector. Why did I come all this way? There is no gold in this river. The wise old man pointed at the piles of rocks that the young man had tossed aside and said, there's gold right there, son. You're just not seeing it. He then cracked open a rock and revealed a few glittering particles of gold. But the young man wasn't convinced. I didn't come all this way for a few tiny flecks of gold. He pointed to the heavy pouch that was hanging from the miner's belt. You found big golden nuggets. That's what I want to find. The old miner smiled knowingly. Ah, but again, you're not seeing clearly. He opened his pouch and the young man was amazed to see that the weight of the pouch was not from large nuggets, but instead from the accumulation of hundreds of small flecks of gold. And as I have been more intentional about looking for these small flecks of gold in my children, in my husband, in myself, in nature, in my life, I have been able to experience this great joy. And it really does take effort. Like Lindsay was saying, we have to extract it. We have to learn how to do that. It takes work and it takes practice, but it's possible. And I know that we can accumulate these flecks of gold, which we'll look back upon and they will be these really big, huge nuggets of gold. Linnell, that is so beautiful. I am again amazed at your gift of being able to summarize, find some very significant and appropriate and applicable stories and things to share with us. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. And that example of your son is just precious. How wonderful that he, he knows and understands those things that he felt that difference and he could feel your love in your actions and that change that you made in what you were doing with him. And then how sweet, how adorable that he thought, oh, do you want to ask me the question so that I can then share this story? I love that. I think there are so many tiny ways that we can show incredible love for our family. Um, making their lives so much richer and ours so much simpler. Um, I, do, I do believe that there are lots of opportunities for us to make our every days so much better. We just need to open our hearts and listen a little bit more so that Heavenly Father can direct us as to how to do that. So thank you so much. You're all so wonderful.